morning everyone, thank you for having me today. So um, yes, I'm Managing Director at Stagecoach, so Stagecoach operates across the UK. Um, in terms of my business in the west of England, I cover seven counties in the west of England. So Gloucestershire into Oxfordshire, Swindon, Wiltshire, Bristol, Herefordshire, that sort of patch. So I've got a network that's pretty broad in the west of England. Um, so I'm here because I'm a managing director of a bus company and I wanted to have a moment with you today at this great event. But I'm actually also here additionally because I'm a person that where buses has always been in my world, it's actually a really big thing to me. And that's because I was raised in a home where my dad was a bus driver. So up in the, in the East Midlands, my dad was a stagecoach bus driver and my mum was a clippy, for those that remember the clippies. The bus conductresses that they met, and I was the product of that beautiful relationship. My dad continued to work in stagecoach, and actually my mum, when they stopped having bus conductresses, she actually ended up in the engineering department, and she was the one that had the trim shop. So whenever you've seen those good old-fashioned maquette seats, that would be my mum from the East Midlands making that happen. So having that kind of heritage of just growing up in a bus family, that meant that I never got dad's taxi. So all the privileged children out there that think I can get wherever I want to go because my mum and my dad will throw me in the car, that's not what I experienced because my mum and dad knew exactly where the buses were and that's exactly how I travelled everywhere. So I've had a very difficult childhood because I didn't get any perks. Um, but it did mean that that flowed through for me. So into my student life when I went to university and into my first jobs, it was just normal to me to get the bus. And if I didn't get the bus, Never been a cyclist, I know there are a lot of cyclists in the room, so I'm an exception. But if it wasn't the bus for me, it was walking. Um, but really, mobility and travelling sustainably, that actually meant that that was normal to me as I was growing up. And I think those learned behaviours, I think if that's something that you can do from a young age, and that's natural to you, I think that's really helpful. I think it's more challenging, actually, if that isn't how you've grown up, and then you're actually trying to introduce yourself to it in later life. So it influenced my career trajectory, so it was obvious why I ended up in buses. So yes, I'm here to sort of champion buses today because it was just important to me. I wanted to make sure that with all the ways we look at active travel, sustainable travel, it's really important to me that I think bus is part of that conversation because to me it's one big jigsaw and it's lots of different pieces and it's how we actually get them working really well together so people have a really good um, range of choices. So. Public buses, I think they're often just seen as it's just a service, it gets people from A to B, it's a very functional thing. I think for me the true potential of buses goes beyond that because I think buses do a, a lot for the community. Sustainability definitely, so climate change is huge. I know for our corporate goals as stagecoach across the UK, we have the 2035 goal when it comes to having a zero emission fleet. About 10% of the UK stagecoach fleet is electric at the moment. And then there's a range of different technologies around the UK. I had the old chip fat buses up in Scotland when I was up there. When I was in the North East, I had the um, gas buses. So I've, we, we do different types of hydrogen. But for us as an organisation, actually electric is where most energy is being put in terms of the R&D and the development that, that we do as a group. And it's what I probably expect to see most across the UK as we move forward. So the role of buses in climate is obviously substantial. We know, you've probably heard before, we talk about one full bus can take 75 cars off the road. And I think when you're needing to move millions and millions of people across counties, we've got to have... Um, a range of options and some of those need to carry lots of people. My Cheltenham and Gloucester corridor, for example, where I've got a few different services, is the biggest, um, is the busiest corridor in Gloucestershire and I support about 7 million passenger journeys a year on that corridor. So I want to see people cycling, I want to see people walking, but I think buses have to be a part of that as well because we're talking about millions of people with, with different needs for how they can best travel. So buses, they also alleviate traffic congestion. Got the service 10 in this morning, beautiful, I was enjoying it, it was one of the new ones, I was thinking this is nice. But I was crawling along the road with all the rest of the traffic, painfully slow, watching my life slip away and, and buses can really be that solution for, for busting the congestion, even more so if we can get the buses out of the traffic, get them moving a bit quicker and get people to jump on the bus and actually get to their destination quicker than everyone else. But 
alleviating that traffic congestion. We know straight away it's quite chronic across our county and it would make our lives a lot more livable and actually up the quality of our urban life a lot better if we didn't spend so much time actually either cycling around traffic and congestion or actually moving um, across the highway. So separate to the environmental benefits a second, I do just want to mention that I, I do think as well buses play a really good part in the local economy. It creates jobs. The more that I can grow as a business, I've got about 1,500 people that I'm responsible for across my counties, about 550 buses. So it's a lot. I'm a fairly big employer in there. I think I do normally make the top 10. But also, it's important to just recognise that it's how we help people have jobs in the <coughs> industries around the county as well. It's serving people to destinations where they can also have jobs in other roles and sectors. And so I want to widen those employment opportunities for residents. So for me, I want to see myself stop from the retraction pressures that I've been in and get back to the grow place because there are so many booming places that are opening up for people to work or do their education. I really want to be part of that solution that actually serves people um, to those employment opportunities. So beyond sustainability and sort of the economic contributions, I do think that buses are the lifeline of social inclusion and I think we notice that even more so when we've been under strain in the bus services and that's been the case across the UK and no one in this room will have missed that fact. I certainly haven't missed that for the last few years myself. And you really notice the impact it has on social inclusion when you're not able to give people what they really need so that they can live their lives the way that they want to live it. So it's essential that we have buses just so we make sure people can get to the key services of education, employment, healthcare and other social activities. Not everybody drives, um, but they're not necessarily in a physical fitness or they're not necessarily of an age or the tasks that they're doing are maybe not necessarily suited to the walking or the cycling. So for me it's just important that we do have a variety of options. So, Despite the myriad benefits of buses, I'm biased obviously, we know that buses are often not the preferred choice. I was looking at the, some stats out on one of the boards out there around a staff survey results and actually bus travel was the least chosen option even though the location of that group of people was actually where there are more buses in the county than anywhere else in the county. <coughs> so it's a stark statistic to see that that was the least chosen uh, mode of getting to work. So we need to encourage people, in my view, to use buses as one of the many choices they have in their toolkit for the week. But it does remind, it needs a harmonious blend of push and pull strategies. It won't just naturally occur, it's the fact. So the push strategies, we need to be courageous and make travelling by car a bit less appealing. And I'm not saying totally take the choice away from people because nobody wants that but we do need to make it less appealing. So whether it's looking at the parking fees, whether it is looking at congestion charges, or looking at limiting town and city access. One of my areas is Oxfordshire, and actually they're trying to be very, very brave as a local authority. They're looking at introducing the workplace levies, not a popular thing. They're looking at putting in bus gates, not a popular thing. And they've rolled out their low traffic neighborhoods. To, uh, to alter where people can actually go with their cars through the communities. None of those things are popular measures, um, but I do really value them as a local authority that actually they're daring to be courageous in the face of a lot of backlash from the car user just to try and make that change. But we also need the pool strategies, I appreciate, and a lot of those pool strategies to get people onto bus, I'm directly responsible for. But there's a range of different things. I need to make sure the buses are efficient and comfortable. I need to make sure that they're safe, that they're covering larger areas. As I say, I don't want to retract my services. I actually want to be in a position, position to grow them, so it's a natural choice to use the bus. Um, I'd like to see real-time up updates at bus stops. We've got 1% of the county bus stops have real-time updates. I'd love to see some investment in that so people can get to a bus stop and actually see something live and up-to-date when they go to get the bus. Um, and, and in the urban areas, we know that things are set up more easily to make a bus journey. It's actually probably the rural areas where we've got a bit more of a conundrum. It's a bit more of a challenge. Typically, they're less populated in our rural areas, as we know. 
And there is a challenge that the lower passenger volumes do create an issue of justifying the cost of running big, bus, but big buses through those community areas. So we do need innovative and flexible solutions. And I mentioned the jigsaw puzzle, and I think that's important. There isn't one solution to moving people around Gloucestershire. It's actually a jigsaw puzzle of lots of things. Community transport really plays a role. At community, again, I keep mentioning Oxfordshire, but there's a lot going on there. We work with the community transport operator where we've worked out how to have shared ticketing and they take people from some less connected areas and they put them onto the higher frequency routes into the city and we work together in partnership to do that. That shouldn't be an exception, that I should be able to talk about that across all of my counties and I feel like that should be quite a normal example that I give you but instead it's actually quite a rare one. The role of DRT, demand responsive travel, I think there is a place for that. Again, I think it's limited how many people it will actually move, but I think it's very, very um, advantageous in certain underserved areas to have a DRT. And again, how can that work with the other buses in the network? So you might have ticketing that means you can move from one thing to another really seamlessly. So I think, again, there's, there's great potential in that, just as it is to see great interchanges. I'd like to see better interchanges. I know we're looking for them with cycling hubs, but lots of bigger and smaller interchanges. An interchange, a hub doesn't have to be huge, but it can still have some really good quality cycling infrastructure to move on to a bus. It doesn't need a lot. Give us some good lighting so we feel safe. Give us somewhere where it then is well lit and it feels good to secure our bikes and we know there's less likelihood that something awry is going to happen with antisocial behaviour. But let's make that movement from whether it's the car or the, the bike onto a bus, let's just make that as seamless as possible and not think it has to be something huge but have lots of different micro opportunities across the counties. So the shift towards electrification, so it's an exciting frontier, frontier in bus transport. The transition from, um, from diesel to electric, it does come with really high upfront costs. Incredibly expensive, it's about, and you were mentioning that, it's about 40% more expensive for us to purchase an electric bus than a diesel bus. And it's tricky because we're still so early in the R&D of electric, whilst we've been talking about it for ages, actually it's still early days. So any technology that we do, it will pass in a moment and there'll be new technology coming, so we're learning a lot of lessons. And it's certainly the case in the bus industry. I'm part, luckily, the electric bus challenge is one that we just have to do because it's a catalyst for innovation. It's pushing us to be creative and find effective solutions. But it's a huge element to fight climate change. And we know that it will be an incredible pull for people for them to consider getting on the bus because it will support that environmental conscience that people have as well as making smoother, quieter journeys, which will be appreciated by everyone. So, in Oxford, apologies for the reference again, myself and Go Ahead, we're investing, it goes live in March next year, jointly £43 million pounds we're investing in a total of 159 electric buses, which turn Oxford into an electric bus city. Um, really big project indeed, and it's really lucky we were able to do it because of the government Zebra funding, which basically covers 75% of the gap over and above the cost of the diesel implementation of that. And then Oxfordshire County Council, they've been using their push strategies around the um, low traffic neighbourhoods, the bus gates and the workplace levies to help combine this scheme with efficiencies out on the highway. Their target is to make buses 10% quicker moving around the network because they know that that will release 10% of fleet back in to be used for other things so we can put buses into new areas. So when they have a look at things like the workplace levy, there's some resource that then can be used because of those efficiencies to serve new people and take them to new areas. So it's a very, very exciting project that I'm really, really proud to be a part of and it certainly, hopefully won't be the last that we see around our patch, particularly if we need to get to our 2035 target. So I call upon all of you in the room as stakeholders, um, whether I'm talking to the government, the private sector, civic society, or any, any one of you present here today, I ask that you please do help support buses in the overall 
um, journey that we're going on, um, I ask that you consider the value of buses as, as one part of a really positive bigger picture. Um, and I promise from a stagecoach point of view, I will pull, up, pull out all the stops that I have and to do everything that I can to have the very best possible bus network out there for people to choose to travel by bus. And that was it from me. I <laughs>